You may be asking yourself, well, what is our second highest function? And that is through art, through music, through dance, through myth, through story, through literature, through rite, through symbol. That is our second highest function as human beings. Why? Because our second highest function as human beings allows us to be in a position, potentially, to connect with our highest function. As we have the opportunity, potentially, to encounter the absolute, to encounter the infinite, to encounter timelessness. And it is art, it is myth that delivers us there. And let's be very clear that popular culture today is not very clear about this myth stuff because we all know that myth is a lie, right? Turn on any TV, it'll tell you quickly. The opposite is the case. No more is myth a lie than a great piece of poetry is a lie, or a great concert, or an extraordinary dance performance. Because this art, this myth, has the capacity to take us somewhere else, to transport us to a place where we have the possibility of connecting with the ultimate. Great art, great poetry, great myth, great literature has the possibility of being transparent to that which is infinite. And it is that encounter and the awe that you and I experience in that encounter that is our highest function. Now, you may say, well, not all art does that for me. That's right, because there are two types of art. There's crummy art, and there's great art. And great art, great myth, takes us to that place. There are no guarantees, but it takes us there, and the possibility of that connection exists. Crummy art, crummy music, bad movies, all point to themselves. Hey, look, look at me. Look at me. Look at me. That's what crummy art does. Great art gets us to look beyond, through the art, to a deeper place. One of the great gifts of life, I think, is art in all of its forms. And the, when we look at a piece of art, no matter what it is, or we experience it, if it's music or dance or great literature, is that there's a, a sense of timelessness about it. The very idea of myth is something that speaks to something beyond and draws us forward. So we begin, the deepest parts of ourself, I think, resonate with great art. Um, that there's something in it that speaks to the parts of our soul that we may not be able to access right away. You know, something captures us and uh, I think that is the role of beauty, too. When, when you see something that's beautiful, you know, it takes your breath away. And you cannot always put into words what that is that draws you in, but it touches you in some way, and it brings forth something in you that maybe you didn't realize was there. And so in that way, art in all of its forms and beauty in so many different ways that we find beauty in the world um, really reaches us deep inside and is, is kind of a reflection. The reason we can recognize it is that it's in us. 
that beauty, that, that depth is in us. And we need great art, and we need these ways of being able to see the beautiful in order to realize more and more of who we are. And so when we have access to these beautiful things and we can create these beautiful things, then that's reaching a depth of, uh, of who we are that we're giving the world, that we're able to give as a gift to others. Do I believe in having a practice? Yes, but the simpler, the better. I don't believe you need a hundred candles in a room for two hours and with um, uh, m music uh, from the 14th century playing in your ear. I don't, I, I think that will only uh, become an excuse not to live well. But I think you need that, that anchor, that compass point, this thing you go back to. Um, those are genuine practices this dialogue with the word, this awareness, what this photograph, what this art is saying that is not said in words that I haven't been able to hear until this moment. This whole notion of this music dipping down inside me and finding emotions I didn't even know were there, allowing me to grow into those, to seek them out, to find more of them, and in that, to give glory. The great teacher who walked out of the desert, the great teacher who sat under the tree, the great teacher who stood in the river, uh, the great teacher who came down the mountain, uh, the great teacher who came out of the cave. Each of those masters had an encounter. They had an encounter with the unspeakable. They had an encounter with pure, raw being. And that encounter was unspeakable, but guess what? When we have that encounter, we gotta go tell somebody. They had to go tell somebody they had to, you can't tell anybody. They had to go tell somebody. You can't tell anybody, it's unspeakable. And so each of those great masters, and I, I, can, I can hear some of you now saying, weren't those all guys? <laughs> and for about a thousand different, not very good reasons, yes, they, they were all guys. And part of why some of you are sitting here today is because the world today needs to hear this message again, needs to encounter this message again. And the world needs to encounter that message in a feminine voice. And today is maybe your day to figure out how that begins to happen. So each of these great teachers had an encounter that they had to share. And to do so, they had to create a myth. They had to create a story. They had to try to communicate some art that people could look through to connect with that which they had connected with. So Amanda knew she had to climb the mountain. She didn't necessarily know why she had to climb. She just, she had to climb the mountain. She was compelled to climb the mountain. She no more knew why she had to climb the mountain than some of us understand why we keep showing up here. Amanda had to climb, she climbed the mountain. Amanda knew she had to personally solitarily explore the peak of being. She went up the mountain. 
she encountered raw, pure being. And on her way down the mountain, her eyes were full of fire, her hands were full of fire. She was ecstatic. She was full of mystery and awe. And she couldn't speak, she was dumbstruck. She couldn't even talk to herself about her encounter with the unspeakable. She could not grasp the one who cannot be grasped, but she was totally grasped by that experience. Amanda came down the mountain, and there at the bottom of the mountain were her friends and some of her followers. They say, hey, hey, Amanda, Amanda, uh, uh, Amanda, uh, what, what happened up there? Well, Amanda just sort of looked right through them like they weren't there. Hey, Amanda, uh, uh, what do you see up there? Well, after some uncomfortable moments, Amanda was compelled to say something. So she, she told them a story. She gave them a little, a little myth and tried to communicate with her friends and followers. And, um, and one or two of them, the good students, they sort of got it. They sort of got this story, this myth is compelling me to I got to go climb the mountain to encounter the peak of being myself. But most of them were just really happy now because they had a story. They had a story and they were, they were happy and they took that, that story, that art, that something real and this is something to believe in. This is, I'm done now. And in fact, these are the ones, as is the case, uh, that ran back to the village to then begin uh, ordering everything based on their interpretations of the story that Amanda had told them when she got off the mountain, not having a clue that it pointed to something deeper. And you know what? This gets repeated and repeated again and again and again and again and again and again in human history as it's being repeated today. And we will not transform this world until there is a revolution in consciousness from refunctioning our highest function, which can then feed our second highest function, which then can allow our third highest function, which is the exercise of politics and economics and how we manage the environment of this planet and human morality and education. There will not be a revolution, a transformation of our third highest function until the other two happen. When I was young, and um, before I had transcended the books, as I think everybody does as they move through life, I, I think that's what the books are meant to help us do if they're presented as they should be. Um, I, was, I was fascinated by one sentence among a hundred others that moved me, but when the scripture says, in the beginning was the word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. At the age of 16, it, it just brought me to a screeching halt. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. As the years went by, 
I began to understand that the simplicity, the oneness of the Word had to be universal. If in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God, then that one Word was permeating the universe. It had to be true. And, and I, it couldn't be false because if it was a universal Word, it was that Word everywhere. So then I, I said to myself, well, if, if, that's, if that's what we're talking about, then as the years went by, I began to understand why all the other words simply began to shrink and go to dust in my life. There were words short, simple words that were the truth. And they had been quite properly mined for thousands of, of years by multiple cultures. And they came out in very highly philosophical or canonical uh, uh, form till nobody knew what word was the word or what any of the silly words meant. And so you can go back through, you can go back to the Vedas, you can go back to the Buddha. But, uh, w when you see what, what the original word was, and then you come up a thousand years and see what somebody else said it was in, in another um, uh, 600 pages, you say to yourself, how'd they get from there to there? The more we conjure up our meanings for something, the more likely we are to destroy the real meaning. I honestly believe that the older we get, uh, the more likely we are to throw off. We're, we're looking now for essence. We're not, we're not playing for rules anymore. We're not playing for any institution's approval, uh, sacred or secular. What we want to know is inside us. What is it about? Where, where are we going? Why have we come? And, and we don't have a lot of time for the other 599 pages. So what we've got to do is find, find the, 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 the words that release this internal knowledge in us in the, in the best way. That's one concept, and that concept is that this, this I, that magnet is pulling me toward this word, too. And when I find that word, that's when the magnet sticks too. In the beginning was the word. What's the word? The word was creation, you, your life, this, the universe. I, I am, I am thought. I am spirit. I am energy. And out of thought and spirit and energy comes the word. What else do you need? It's that listening for the word. There's a word. The tree is a word to you. Those trees that tell us around this globe, don't, as Jesus did to the weeping women of Jerusalem, don't cry for me. You know, if, you keep th if these things keep up the way you're doing them, it's you and your children who will suffer. That's the word. That's the word from the water and the word from the air. And be careful of all these other words because they are obscuring the word. The scripture is very clear. I wish you well and not woe. I put you here for you to be happy. And, and, and you, have, you have grown both, both beauty and evil because the original word has been, is being overlooked. People are, people are assuming that their word is the word. Their word, the money, is the word. Sex is the word. Corruption is the word. Uh, war is the word. Power is the word. Authority is the word. No. In the beginning was the word creation. And the word was with God, God's word. Creation was God's word. And the word was God. What you do here, you do what you do to me. That's my spirituality.